What's up folks, welcome to 802 Garage. In this video, I'm going to show you how to replace a factory wiring harness connector and like this one, wires, pins, connector and all from scratch with some basic tools and knowledge. In this case, we'll be working on this 2001 Subaru Impreza 2.5 RS, which actually has a JDM EJ20 turbo engine. However, the skills in this video apply to pretty much any car and almost any wiring connector. There's only slight variances, but overall this video is going to show you how to go from this to this. So obviously one of these connectors is not like the other. This one has been spliced here. It was spliced into the car here. These wires are all beat up. The connector end is filthy and beat up. The seals are kind of sticking out. This one, nice and new. Flush seals, brand new wire, no splices. Going to work a lot better. This is everything you're going to need to replace a factory wiring connector on your vehicle. I know it may seem like a lot, perhaps overwhelming, but I'm going to link everything in the description below, well labeled, easy to find, so you can get exactly what you need to do this job well. You won't necessarily need every single thing. You can get away with a little bit of knowledge and creativity, but I recommend all this to do the job right. First up, we have the actual connector you're going to need. This is a Sumitomo DL-090 connector. It can be really hard to find exactly what connector your car needs. So if you need some help with that, let me know in the comments below, but I'm also going to list some sites that really have a wide selection of connectors for very affordable prices. Just this can cost $15 to $30 on an automotive wiring specialty site, but I got this for only $3.60 from a smaller store called Cycle Terminal, and there are similar deals at other retailers I'll list as well. Now this came with four of the terminals that you're going to need to connect it to your component, and it also came with four of the seals. So that was a complete kit for only $3.60, but I actually bought some extra pins and some extra seals for only $0.96 cents and $0.68 cents for four of each. So grand total with shipping, this is only $9.89. And that's a really great deal. You can actually buy one of these pre-fitted with a pigtail, but sometimes they can be really expensive or really hard to find for your vehicle. And in this case, with the wrong color wire and the wrong gauge of wire, it was still at least $15. So this is cheaper. Now you are of course going to need wire. And in this case, I bought 18 gauge TXL wire. There are multiple types of automotive wire. There's GXL, SXL, TXL. There's also other cheaper primary wire and there's Tefzel or mil spec wire, which is fancier, but a little bit more expensive. TXL wire is usually all you're going to need. It's extra thin wall, so it's lightweight, fits into tight spaces, it's easy to work with, and matches OEM quality. Now, I got six colors, 25 feet of each, for only $25.39 shipped, which is a pretty good deal on wiring. It can be really hard to find wire with the exact striping you need to match OEM, but places like 4R Customs Wire do sell it. You just have to look hard, and I'm going to list a few wiring sites below that should be able to find you whatever you need. If you really want to match exactly the OEM, it can be a bit pricey, but you can find it. This is 18 gauge wire, and you really need to to make sure that you match the factory wiring gauge when you replace a connector. Now, of course, gauge size, the higher the number, the smaller the wire, the lower the number, the larger the wire. In this case, if the factory wiring was 18 gauge, you really need to use at least 18 gauge. You could get away with 16 gauge for the end of the run, but especially for power and ground wires, you need to make sure that they are the original size. Signal wires, not so much, but you have to be able to handle the power your component is going to draw. You also need to make sure you match your wire gauge to whatever the connector calls for. The Sumitomo connector, the minimum wiring gauge is 20 and the maximum is 16. Obviously our 18 gauge wire falls within that. And you also need to make sure that your pins and your seals are meant for that gauge of wire. Any website you buy these connectors from should list what wire gauges they work with. You may have to convert from metric square area back to AWG or vice versa, but you will get it with a little bit of research. Again, if you need help with any of the wiring or connectors, let me know in the comments, but please do check out the sites below first and do your own research. I bet you can figure out if you put in the time. I also highly recommend these heat shrink buck connectors when you're replacing wiring in a vehicle. So one side is going to go over your factory loom, one side over the new wire, you crimp it down and then you heat it up. And these are actually self-adhesive and they will seal around the wire and keep out water and debris. Now I recommend these over soldering just like most automotive wiring specialists do because if you don't have the right tools and a lot of skill with soldering, you can accidentally make a joint that doesn't make a proper connection that will corrode over time or that goes too far into the wire, makes it brittle and it'll snap and your joint will fail over time. These are a little bit more foolproof and they definitely work to do the job properly. For those, you are going to need a proper crimper like this. You can get away with just a more basic crimper, but this is really nice because it's a ratcheting crimper. This is also by iWIS. Again, I'm gonna list all these tools below and you just squeeze it and you'll know you're done when it clicks 
and you can release. And you can even see it's color coded to work with these connectors. You can even buy these as a set. Pretty affordable and I use them all the time. Really just make the job easier and you know you get it done right. You're also obviously going to need some wire strippers. These are just the basic kind. Put around the wire, strip and pull. It has some crimpers on it, which you can get away with for some things, but I really wouldn't use it for either of these jobs if you can avoid it. And these are just a pair of automatic wire strippers. They just make the job quicker and these were pretty cheap. They work fairly well, although sometimes they can damage the wire. So this is if you're being more careful. Lastly, you're probably gonna wanna finish up the job so it looks nice. You can get this heat shrink tubing to put around the connectors for extra protection and to make it look nice. You'll probably want some wire loom like this, which again will protect your wires and also make it look nice in factory. And you're probably gonna need some electrical tape to go around that, whatever you prefer, whatever look you like, but this stuff is pretty affordable and definitely nice to have on hand. So that's basically it for what you're gonna need to do this job. These are just a couple of replacement coil packs I have for the car because if replacing the connector doesn't fix my ignition issue, I'm gonna be trying these as well. Sometimes you'll need to replace your component along with your connector if it melted here or if the pins inside of the component are damaged. In this case, these coil packs fit a 99 to mid 2000s Subaru. And this connector, while it works for this Subaru coil pack, also works on certain Mazda Miatas, RX-7s, and potentially some other Japanese vehicles. Now that I've covered everything you're going to need to get this job done, let's go back to the car, chop out the old harness, start measuring for a wire, and then we'll make up our new connector. Getting back to the car, since the connector we want to replace actually in a kind of difficult area right here, you can see how screwed up all these splices are. I'm actually going to remove some of the spark plug wires and the alternator so that we have a much better view at the situation. As always, a quick note before you do any electrical work on your car, you should definitely disconnect the ground or even both terminals from your battery so there's no chance of any kind of electrical shock or ruining components. So definitely do that first. All right, that's out of the way. Disconnected the battery first, remove the alternator, very easy to do on a Subaru, and now we have the offending wiring much more exposed. Let's get a closer look. The wiring to this connector has seen better days. We have at least one splice here which looks like it was done quite well another splice here which is covered by electrical tape and is very unknown tied to the alternator wiring with some more electrical tape maybe another splice here so hopefully it's only three and then it's down here to the original harness we don't have a lot of length to work with which is going to be a pain but it should be doable so let's clean this up a little bit more now of course you just want to be careful not to cut any of the wires or any of the nice sheathing like this while you're at it this connector end is a little old and cranky, so I'm gonna just use a screwdriver and I'm not gonna pry hard. I'm just gonna apply a little bit of pressure to help me get this off. I'm gonna make sure you push down on whatever clip holds it in. Don't ever try to pry a connector off with a screwdriver without knowing exactly how it disconnects so you don't break anything. In this case, we're not even saving the connector in, so that's okay. A little bit of a closer look. They didn't leave much of a pigtail on this when they reused it, so they had to splice it right here. I do think that this is factory wiring, although it's not quite matching what I thought I had from the wiring diagram. Before I cut this, I'm actually gonna take off all the tape to make sure that I can label these and know which pins they correspond with on the connector. I know the car was working as is, so I know if I reconnect it all the same, the car should still work. I just think there may be problems with intermittent signals in this wiring or too much resistance. So even if you don't have a wiring diagram when you are doing this, as long as you reconnect the wires in the same order they came off as, as long as you know the wiring was correct, you're good to go. Having a wiring diagram is always really, really helpful though, just to double check your work. Or if the connector got ripped off or burned, you definitely need a wiring diagram to know that you're doing it right. You can actually see I nicked the harness right here. So whenever you're stripping the coverings off wires, you need to be really careful not to damage the wire. If you plan to reuse it, in this case, I'm not reusing any of this, so I don't care, but you should always be careful. Be careful not to cut yourself, of course, too. So I think we got lucky here and there are only two actual splices. So I don't know what the rest of that electrical tape was about. Maybe they were just trying to wrap it like a nice loom covering, but they didn't do a great job. This looks like either oversized heat shrink or more electrical tape. At least now we have our wires exposed. We have connector and we have pins one, two, three, four, I believe, according to the wiring diagram. So we can separate those out and figure out which one goes where. We have one, two, three, Four. It does look like this is factory harness, so I'm not sure why my wiring diagram doesn't match, but you're definitely gonna find that happens sometimes. Maybe I looked up the wrong model. As far as I know, this harness is from a 2001 Impreza 2.5 RS. I'm gonna write down which one went to which to make sure I hook it back up right. And actually, before I go any further, I'm gonna clean up these wires just so I actually know which colors they are. 
black, red with a green stripe, yellow with a black stripe, and this one I'm gonna call green. Almost looked like it had a stripe, but I think it's just green. So I think the only one I got wrong was black, which if I misread the wiring diagram, I thought B stood for blue, whereas B actually stood for black, for example. Maybe that's the case. I'll double check and get back to you. Quick unexpected teaching moment. I have confirmed that these wires are red with a dark green stripe, yellow with a black stripe, black and sky blue, because I have found a wiring diagram which does actually match this, though it's not from a 2001 Impreza 2.5 RS, nor from any car I can find with the single coil pack EJ205. But I also realized that this wiring harness may have come with this engine. Still no luck finding those wiring diagrams. However, I also know that these right at the end here are the correct colors, so I won't have any problem matching them up either way. I can always refer to this connector after I cut it off. Still very strange that I can't find a wiring diagram that corresponds to this car or this engine, but let me show you where I did find it. This is a late 02 or early 03 Subaru Legacy, and you can see it has the same coil pack and the same wiring. So we have red with a dark green stripe, almost looks black, yellow with a black stripe, black and sky blue, or some kind of blue, at least light blue, they call it, depending on the wiring manual. So that's the same wiring. Moral of the story here is, even though you can look up wiring diagrams and I highly recommend it, make sure you just match up your wires from your original harness to make sure everything works properly. Now that we know we can hook this back up right, we want to save as much of the OEM harness as possible as long as the wire's in good shape. So I'm going to cut a little bit into here right before the splice. We can always cut a little more if we need, but we can't add wire back. Well, not the original wire at least. A little bit of solder right there. All right, just laying this out how it's gonna be in the final harness. And now I'm just gonna clip off a little bit of excess so they're all the same length. Cutting them all the same length like this is just nice and neat, but if you need to fit this into a really tight space or you wanna make sure that there's no way the joints can ever rub against each other, then you can cut them offset so that each connector isn't actually right next to each other and they have a little bit of spacing apart. So like one, two, three, four, easier to do when you have a longer length of wire and then it'll be easier to bunch the wires together. Now that the old harness we're replacing is removed, we need to figure out how long we need to make the wires to the new connector. Now you can obviously just use your old harness as a benchmark if it fit properly, which this one did without any problems. It might actually be a little bit too long or of course you can take your brand new wire lay out the harness how you know you want it to be routed make sure that you leave enough clearance for whatever's going to be in the way and just put it about where it needs to go now of course you don't want way too much to leave spaghetti all over your vehicle but you also don't want too little because you need some strain relief and ability to route it so just use your finger get it where you need it, and then mark it with something that you know you're gonna easily be able to see. In this case, we can match up all four wires to the length of this one since we know they're gonna be the same, but if by chance you do need different wires, just mark each one one at a time. Before I do anything else with these wires, I wanna clean them up a bit more, so I'm gonna use some rubbing alcohol. Oh yeah, that's making a big difference already. That wire almost looks blue now. Much better. Now that we have our wire length marked, we can take our other wires, line it up next to this one, and mark them as well. I've got a couple magnets here just to make my life a little bit easier. And there you go, those are the same length, repeat. Obviously black is gonna be a bit harder to see, but that's okay because we're not actually going to cut this yet. We're going to put the connector ends on first and then make sure that they fit in the connector because if we do screw up an end and we already cut the wire, then we waste some wire. If this ends up too short, we can't use it. We'd have to cut a whole new length. So let's move on to putting in the connector ends. You could even make the entire connector first and then lay it on the car, cut your wires on the car so you know you have enough length. Let's get a terminal pin on the end of that wire. And this is the first part of the job that really requires some specialty items and equipment. So this is the pin that's going to slide inside the connector and you can see there's a portion of smaller tabs right there which is going to crimp around the wire and the longer tabs right there which are going to crimp around the seal. These are the seals we're going to be using for the semi-tunnel connector. This little end is going to fit right in there and get crimped into place. Another quick note, you do need to make sure everything is crimped nice and tight so that it can fit inside of this without any resistance and it locks into place nicely. So I'm gonna show you a few tips on how to do that right. We only need to strip a very small portion of this wire because it only needs to be bare right inside of that smaller set of wings where it's going to get crimped onto the bare wire. So we're going to use the automatic strippers to do this one. And all we need to do is measure exactly how much we need to strip, which looks like four millimeters or so of insulation, but basically to right there. I'll mark it with my thumbnail. And then with these automatic strippers, you want to line it up with that little claw down there on the bottom and it's going to crimp and you can see the top jaw comes in 
pulls the insulation right off for you. But you can also see these automatic strippers can dig into the wire jackets just a little bit, and that's where it's nice to use the regular set of strippers if you prefer. So let's just check and make sure we strip the right amount of wire. And that does look pretty good. Could be a little bit cleaner, another benefit of using the traditional strippers. And there we go, some nice clean bare wire stripped perfectly to length. Before we actually crimp on the terminal pin though, we have to make sure we put the seal onto the wire so we don't forget it. Although we could put it on by cutting down the wire if we happen to forget, which happens all the time. Could have even put it on before stripping the wire because sometimes these strands get caught around the seal. I'll do that for the next few wires. Next, we need our first specialty tool, this crimper by iWIS. There are of course multiple brands and styles of this, but this one works pretty good, especially for the price. You can see right here, it marks this as 20 to 18 for the crimps. So I'm going to put the terminal right inside of that slot and just barely get it started. Make sure you have it nicely centered around those wings and that the pin is nice and flat, perpendicular to the tool. And then I'm just going to feed the wire in until it butts up where the insulation is right at the beginning of those wings. You can see it just barely protrudes from the other side. And then going to crimp. And you should be able to just squeeze until the tool stops. You can see it won't move anymore. Release. And we should have a really solid tight crimp on that wire. And that looks pretty good. Maybe the wires protrude just a tiny bit too much, but it should work for these purposes. And you always wanna give a tug test. So if you can pull these wires out, oh, there we go, it's not a good crimp. So that was not quite firm enough. Before completely sacrificing this pen, I'm actually going to try to step down to the 24 to 22 gauge crimp and just give it a little bit extra. All right, and let's try the tug test one more time. So I really don't think that's going anywhere. That's nice and tight, good. So I may have to repeat that with every connector or maybe I just didn't crimp hard enough the first time with the right size die on the crimper, but you're gonna find that depending on which pins you're using, which wire and which tools. So now we're going to slide the seal into place and you basically just want those two tabs to be centered on the flat part of the seal right before the ridges, just like that. And this is going to provide the debris and waterproof seal once it's inside of the connector end. Then as I showed you, this crimping tool actually has two spots for seals, a smaller one and a larger one, but these are some fairly long tab wings so I think I may actually go with the largest of the fold over crimping dies because that's actually going to fold these tabs a little bit into the seal which will give it a more firm hold and also make it a little bit more compact. So you can try it both ways and see what you prefer. Just for demonstration purposes I'll start out with the smaller seal because that definitely looks like it's going to be the right size for this seal end. I'll even show you with another seal. So I put that in there and close that all the way. You can see that's just barely the same size as the seal. So that's part of why I'm worried about crimping the tabs with that is I'm not sure it'll give a firm enough hold on the seal, but let's try it. Start it, try to make sure it's nice and even. Once again, you can see those winglets folding in just like they're supposed to, they're fairly well centered. And just go. But so there you go, there it is crimped, but I don't think it has as firm of a hold on that seal as I would like because I can move it around just a little bit. All I'm gonna do is go back to the largest, the 16 to 14 gauge, and I'm not gonna crimp it super firm just enough to get those winglets to fold in a little. So that's not perfect and beautiful, but I was doing it after doing the first style of crimp, so that may be why. However, I do think it's gonna be compact enough and I can beautify it a little bit if I really feel like it. There you go. That looks a little bit better to me. They folded over each other and I'm gonna call that good. I'll do the next one with just the 16 to 14 and I'll show you how it looks and we'll see if we like that better. Like I said, this may take some experimentation because different types of pins for different connectors are going to have longer or shorter winglet sizes and slightly different sizes on the tabs to fold over on the wire. Sometimes you can look up guides online to see how other people have done the exact same style of connector. Other times you're not gonna be able to find any resources and you just need to guess and check. And that's why I bought extra seals and pins because they were super, super cheap. And obviously I have plenty of wire if I screw up as well. Also, you want your pin to end up nice and straight like this. Sometimes they like to bend right there at the joint next to the seal, and then it's harder to get into the connector. You can just bend it back into shape as long as you're not too rough and don't break the pin. I know there's a lot of little details here, but as long as you go through this one step at a time, you will be able to make your first connector properly, even if you have a few mess ups, and the more you do this, the better you'll get at it. So now let's try to fit this pin into our connector. In this case, we know the blue wire is going to go into the fourth hole on the connector with the locking tab facing up right here. And you can see if you look deep inside of this connector, there's actually some little locking levers. And in this case, they're going to grip right there, right past the flat part of the pin. So we need that facing down. 
and it should go in and we should hear a nice snap when it's actually fit into place. Just like that, and you can see our seal butted up pretty much exactly where you would want it, and this connector isn't moving around at all, can't be yanked out of the connector. That's awesome. So that's one wire done, looking great. I'm gonna do the next wire and use the techniques I talked about when doing the first pin and show you how it comes out. Gonna move to the black wire next because that goes into the third slot of the connector. I'm gonna check how much we need to strip and try to mark it with my thumbnail. Use the manual strippers, the 18 gauge slot. All right, check that. Maybe a tiny bit long, but looks good. Now I forgot once again to put the seal on first, but that's not a problem as long as our wires don't fray. Use the crimpers. I am going to try the 20 to 18 gauge slot one more time, just because I might not have crimped hard enough last time. So just barely get the winglet started. Make sure they're nice and centered. Make sure everything is perpendicular and squared up. Insert the wire until the insulation just about butts up with the winglets. Crimp. Let's see how this one turned out. All right, pull test. Oh yeah, that's not going anywhere. So now we can move on to the seal. So like I said, this time I'm just going to use the 16 to 14 gauge crimp die to see if I can fold these wings in. And I'm just not gonna go super hard. Sometimes you need to fold them in a little bit before you can get started. There you go, we're almost there. So now you wanna make sure that this is all perpendicular, just like before, and centered if you can. You can actually see those wings as they come closer up and up. Let's see how that was. I didn't want to crimp too hard. Mm, kind of mangled the connector a little bit there, so I'm not super happy with that. I'll probably just try to form that back a little bit, and I think I will just continue with the seal portion for the next crimps instead, but I think I can beautify this. Let me try for just a second. It's not perfect, but that seal's not going anywhere and nobody's ever gonna see it. So let's see if this will insert into the connector. And most importantly, that didn't compromise our wire integrity at all or the integrity of the seal ridges. So it should still all perform properly. It's just not as pretty as it could be. And that's gonna happen sometimes when you're wiring up a connector. Let's put this in the right way into the third slot with the tab facing up and see if it all fits. Like I said, that's straight, so it should be good. Here we go, we got a nice click. It's not coming out. Seals are meeting up nicely. That's two out of four wires done. I'll do the last two on a time lapse, hopefully remembering the seals first. Actually, let's do that right now so we don't forget. There we go. And now I'll carry on putting on those last two pins. You've seen it twice, but let's go over it again. The main point here is that you will get better at this with some practice and repetition. As with pretty much any skill, you just need the basic tools, you need the correct supplies, and you need to go through this process and check your work. Every time you crimp a pin, make sure that you do a pull test. Pull on it hard. If that wire moves, recrimp it again like I did right there. There's no shame in that as long as you don't mangle the connector. Make sure the seal is on and can't be pulled out easily. The wire should now be ready to go into the connector. Let's listen to the satisfying click. If you've made it this far in the video, the coolest part is you now pretty much know how to wire an entire car. It doesn't get much more complicated than this. If you can terminate pins at both ends of a wire and put them into factory connectors, you can make almost any part of a vehicle harness. Sure, there's always soldering directly to circuit boards or making potted connectors, but if you can learn to read a wiring diagram and you know that power is supposed to go from one end of a wire to another end of a wire between two devices, if you can follow that step by step and pin wires like this, you can make an entire wiring harness. Take it one step at a time, always double check your work and enjoy the satisfying clicks. And there you go. We actually have a finished connector end. None of these are coming out. And then we can push in this orange tab to lock them all in place. And you can actually see all our happy little connector pins right down in there. Nice, shiny and new. And again, none of them can come out. So we are good to test fit this with a coil. Here is a brand new old stock coil made by Diamond, and we'll see if this clips on. Oh, very satisfying, very firm fit. Cool, does it come off? 
Well, maybe if my hands could grip. And you never want to pull by the wires. Oh, new connector and new coil. Very nice fit, that's what you want. There is a seal down inside of the connector, of course, to keep debris and water out from even getting to the pins. And that was making a nice seal. You can see right there where it disturbed the dust on the inside of this connector and also made a nice noise when it came out. So this is good to go on the car. Now, like I said, you could bring this with all your excess wire over to the car, make sure you have it the length you want, then cut the wires while you have it on the car so you're sure. I'm pretty confident in my measurements, so I'm going to take this, make sure these are all nice and even. So you didn't even really have to mark them before if you didn't want to, and you can see my marks are a little bit off from each other, but I'm just trying to show you multiple techniques to get this job done. I'm gonna give myself a tiny bit extra here, and I'm just going to snip all these wires. Boom. And there you have it. You now have a completed pigtail harness with connector end, all brand new. Looks nice and fancy. You can do whatever colors you want. And you could even sell this online for 20, 25, 30 bucks a pop and make a nice profit. Just one more reason to learn wiring. Now that the wiring pigtail is complete, it's probably best to check and make sure that it actually fits where it's supposed to. And there we go. We got plenty of length, that's for sure. And this will all be covered up later so you won't see all the colorful wires, both fortunately and unfortunately. To splice these harnesses, like I said, we're going to be using these heat shrink butt connectors. But before I go any further, don't forget your heat shrink tubing if you're going to use some. So I'm going to put one of these over each of the wires and you want to make sure that you use a heat shrink tubing that's just barely big enough to fit over your butt connectors. This doesn't quite fit right this second, not easily, but once this shrinks down, this should be the perfect size. I'm going to slide it all the way up so that when I do heat up those heat shrink butt connectors, it doesn't shrink this tubing at all. There we go. Can't tell you how many times I forgot my heat shrink tubing before doing some wiring and had to redo it. For these butt connectors, we need to strip the wire, but we need to strip it more than we did for the connector ends. Basically what you want is for this wire to go in and for the bare wire to be exposed about half the length of this metal section in the middle so that the ends of the wires, but right up to that little crimp there. So really we want to strip, I'd say maybe a quarter of an inch, five to six millimeters. And with these, if you go a little bit overboard, you're fine, but you definitely don't want too little because that could ruin the crimp. So you stick that in and use the manual strippers and go just a tiny bit more. And yes, I'm being picky. You can be as picky as you want. And there you go. Hopefully you can see right there at the edge, you can just barely see the wire exposed sticking out from that metal cylinder in the middle, but there's plenty of insulation into where the heat shrink is gonna go down around the wire. Now we have that strip like we want. That's where this IWIS ratcheting crimper comes in. This thing is super nifty for this because you can take your butt connector, put it into the color corresponding die, and you can just start ratcheting until it barely grips the connector. And you basically want this to crimp that half of the barrel. So right past that little metal crimp I showed you before, you do not want to go right in the middle of the butt connector. You want to go on whichever half you're currently putting a wire in. And then because the crimper holds it for you, which is the really nice part, you can just slide this in, make sure you don't catch any wires on the side of the barrel. And then once it's in, just crimp until the tool releases like that. Let go and you should have a finished crimp. So give it a tug test as always. And these crimps are good for 22 gauge all the way up to 16 gauge. So our 18 gauge is kind of in the middle there. And even if a couple of these wires are a little bit smaller, they won't be smaller than 22. So these are perfect. And that's definitely not going anywhere. Now you could strip and crimp all four of these at once, but then it can be a little bit hard to heat up the connector. So I'm actually going to do one wire at a time. That's also going to let me make sure that I arrange them nicely so it all lays well. If I know I want the wire routing to kind of make this shape, then I'm gonna to try to crimp this in there so it wants to be like that naturally. Back onto this. On the other half. Just make sure they're nice and twisted. Insert it into the barrel and crimp. And there you go. The first wire is reconnected. Pull test. Oh yeah, neither of those are going anywhere. And now we can heat shrink that down. Now you can shrink this with just a lighter. You just don't want to focus on any one spot for too long. You can end up burning the insulation or actually ruining the seal and you don't want that. But it's a lot better if you actually have a heat gun like this one. This was super cheap, like 10 bucks from Harbor Freight, I think. I'll also link one down in the description if you don't have one. This works great. Just put it on low heat at first. And you just want to make sure you don't hit anything else that you don't want to melt. Obviously, I'm pretty close to this. 
so we should be okay. You can see that's starting to shrink. You want to make sure you don't get any of the heat on your heat shrink tubing up above. Put it on high just because it's taking a minute. And you'll actually start to see some of the waterproof sealant come out of the end of that tube. And when it's all around evenly on that end, you'll know that that side is done. And you don't want to focus the heat too long in any one spot here either, because you can still burn it with a heat gun. And there you go, I think that's pretty much done. Look how nice that looks. Nice and sealed from any moisture or debris. And then we can even add our heat shrink tubing. Like I said, it is technically extra, but it's not a bad thing to have more protection. The only thing is if this is still really hot, the heat shrink tubing will shrink immediately and you don't want that. So I'm gonna try to slide this over fast. And you want this kind of right in the middle, obviously, if you want it to look really nice. Low heat. And you can see how fast that's shrinking right down. So it looks like if I could have gone with a size in between this and the next smallest size I have, it would have been a little better because you can see that little gap there at the end, but it's still nicely sealed around the edges of the buck connector, so that's not too bad. And if you were really concerned about making this extra waterproof, you could actually put some silicone gel in here, and that would make sure that no moisture were getting. But that's plenty for this, a lot of protection, and we are going to add some of that loom afterwards. So now I'm gonna do the other four wires, heat shrink all the connectors, and this will be pretty much done other than the loom. I'm gonna do the red wire next so that I can start laying these out how I want so they kind of don't all get all tangled up like they were originally. You know, you don't want them looped all around each other like this because that just makes the harness harder to work with. So we really just kind of want them to lay down here like they do up on the connector. Strip and repeat for each of the wires. There's really no wrong way to do this as long as you end up with continuity where it belongs and all of the wires are protected from the environment. If you want your wiring jobs to last, you just need to make sure they are waterproof, not chafing on anything, Thing, and of course that they actually send electricity where they should and there you go just like that this harness is done Whew. so much better than it was before you just have one continuous line of wires leading right up to that coil pack not nasty and dirty and beat up and these splices are beautiful and well protected and the colors of the wires match a lot better for what that's worth before adding the loom just to make it look pretty let's try to test fire the car we can do it without the alternator but we do need to hook up the battery and first let's get the satisfaction of that nice click ah there it is We'll put these spark plug wires back on. Make sure we remove the alternator belt so that doesn't go flying and damage something. Clear any tools out of the engine bay. Make sure everything is clear from the moving parts of the engine. Temporarily reconnect the battery. At which point, if you see any sparks or smoke, just make sure you remove it immediately and check your work. All right, and let's test fire this engine. All right, so we now know that our wiring is a success. Always best to test your wiring before reassembling everything if you can. Sometimes you can't get away with it, but just double check your work and you should be good to go. Now that we know everything works, we can disconnect the battery again temporarily. Clear the way to do a little bit more work. Then just take whatever loom you're going to use. This is probably a little bit oversized, but it does match some of the other OEM stuff. And the smaller size I have wouldn't fit around these butt connectors, so this is gonna work just fine. It's split loom, of course, so it makes it a little bit easier to get it around the wires. Otherwise, you would have had to put it on before doing the splicing. And see, it's a little bit fat right there. That's one of those areas where it might have been nice to stagger the connectors, but like I said, it didn't have a lot of OEM wire to work with. All right, and as long as we're not straining any of these wires, we just want to leave a little tiny bit exposed at the end of that connector. And we can cut this off down here so we have just enough to go over that old piece of harness. So you should be able to put some of that split loom over the old loom, just like that. Then you're going to take some electrical tape and you really do want to use good quality electrical tape, especially for an engine bay where there's a ton of heat. The really, really cheap stuff like from Harbor Freight, just not worth it. Uh, don't do it in my opinion. So you can kind of wrap this as much as you want. I'm just going to wrap it in a few key places to make sure this doesn't come apart. And you can hold the roll and wrap it around and do all that stuff. But since I have a really tight space here, I'm just going to cut off some strips and use it like that. And really, this isn't super critical. It's just to prevent chafing 
and damage, protects from heat a little bit and makes everything look prettier. The most important thing is to make sure all your splices are water and debris proof and that your connector is assembled correctly, but that's already looking pretty good. Slide this back on. <clears throat> Nicely clicks into place. And there you go. Finished loom right there. It's going to sit like this behind the alternator, tuck right underneath there even, and that looks really good. Let me give you a close up. Very nice. So now it's just time for reassembly and we should be good to go. One more quick final test. So there you have it folks, that wiring harness is all set. And now you should be able to fix any wiring connector on your car as well. It just takes a few tools and a little bit of knowledge. If this video was helpful for you, please leave a like. And if you have any questions about wiring in general or how to find some information, please leave a comment below. Also below in the description is links to every tool and every supply you could need to do this job. Thank you so much for watching. And if you like this style of informative content or you just like project cars in general, please consider subscribing to 802 Garage. Thank you once again, everybody so much. I really do appreciate it. And I'll catch you very soon.